Good morning, church family. We're so glad you're here with us today. Here are some things for you to keep in mind. Coming up on April 19th is Kid Tensity. This will be open for our third through fifth graders, and this will be a night of sound teaching, games, and plenty of food to go around. So be sure to register. You don't want your kiddos to miss this. Less than one month away, May 3rd through 4th, is our women's event with Nancy Guthrie. This biblical theology workshop will help us to get to know our Bibles better by articulating the story of the Bible and identifying the major themes of the Bible. Ladies, there are still spots left. It's gonna be a great event and you don't wanna miss it, so make sure you register today. The biggest HG Kids event of the year is coming up soon. Summer Blast will be from June 17th through 20th. This is VBS Reimagined. Summer Blast will be held in the morning at our Harris campus and in the evening at our Mallard Creek campus. This is for all HG kids, so parents, please register your kiddos today because they won't want to miss it. First time guests, we're so glad you're here visiting with us today. Look at the front of your worship guide and scan that QR code to find out more about HG. We're so glad you're here with us today. Let's get ready to worship. Well, good morning, church family. It's a great day to worship the Lord, amen? We'll stand together as we sing out.
Psalm 92, hear now the words of our God beginning in verse 1. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the works of your hands I sing for joy. Today, if you've come into this place and there is anything but a sense of joy, satisfaction, contentment, security in Christ, it's why we open our services in a word of prayer. We do so because we recognize that worship like this takes work. This isn't something you just stumble into lightly. And so as I pray today, I'm going to pray for my own soul and for yours. Together, let's ask the Lord to do such a work that we are prepared to worship Him, not only in song, but in the very listening to the word proclaimed, through the very prayers we pray this Lord's day. Why don't you join me as we pray, and let's ask God to prepare our hearts to worship. Father in heaven, we are asking that by the power of your spirit, you would so move in every heart in this room, and all who are joining us online, would you so move that we would sing in spirit and truth, that we would have ears to hear as we listen to your word? Would you give us a sense of expectation as we listen to the word proclaimed? As we pray, Lord, would you give us a fixated mind and heart on you? Drive away the burdens and distractions of this week. I pray that all who have gathered would sense that weight and just roll off their shoulders so that they might worship you, Lord Jesus, who alone are the reason we have gathered. We want to exalt you this hour, so help us, we pray, to do just that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. my 
Won't you pray with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity we have to gather, to lift high the name of Jesus, to worship you. Lord, I pray that our hearts would sing in unison, that sing of your greatness, of your power, of your might. Lord, thank you that you've saved us. Thank you for the chance we have to sit under the teaching of your word. I pray that, Lord, as your word goes forth, you change hearts and minds. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Gerald. As you're seated, let me invite you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. We're back in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 11. If you're visiting with us, we uh, do something called exposition. That is, we go through books of the Bible. We start really in chapter 1 in a book of the Bible and just sort of work through it so that every sermon will feel in some ways uh, like a Bible study. We'll read the passage and then talk about what does the passage mean to me? What does it mean for me? How does it affect my life? What do I do in light of the truth of the Bible. So that's what we'll be doing here. Mark chapter 11, at the very end of Mark 11 is verse 27. Uh, This morning I'll read from verse 27 down to verse 33. So while you're turning there, a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, One is we just had at the North Carolina Baptist Missions Conference. It was at our Harris campus. It was an unbelievable uh, weekend. Thousands of people there. The place was just packed, overrun with people. And all of our people, we had so many volunteers that uh, made it happen, and I have received so many messages and texts from people outside of Charlotte talking about you and just bragging about uh, just how friendly, how hospitable, how great everybody was, and I took absolute full credit for every bit of it. (laughs) I'm very thankful for our church and very thankful for our mission-mindedness. We just had a mission team come off the field of Ecuador, and our students were on mission last week, and we have another team that'll be going off in June. This is something you ought to give some consideration to. Going to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We'll be doing that in June. You can sign up online or you can call our missions office here at the church. We're going there with North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention that has planted a church there and seeking to plant more churches. There are about 450 camps uh, there around Harrisburg. And we'll be working with people of all kinds, um, homeless folks, we're working with those in the camps, making meals, and then uh, in in the evening, preaching the gospel. If you have any interest in that, maybe you've never been on a mission trip, this might be a really good one to start with. I would just invite you to uh, look into that. You can do that online or call our missions office. All right, let's go to the Bible. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. If you found verse 27, won't you stand? We'll read together God's word. Mark 11. Verse 27 through 33. Grass with us and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin now. Verse 27, you follow along in yours. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priest and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question and answer me. I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. They discussed it with one another and they said, if we say from heaven... He will say, why then did you not believe him? But we, shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us a new view and insight to your absolute authority in all things. We willingly, joyfully recognize and submit ourselves to the authority of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help every person here that has resisted and found themselves in hardness or bitterness. God, I pray that you would soften that. There would be a turning a joyful turning to you today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. We 
We started the service with Dr. Kyler Smith reading from the Bible and welcoming all of you. Kyler is the senior associate here. Let me just say in front of our church that Hickory Grove Baptist Church has been very good to Kyler Smith. <laughs> A little over 10 years ago in February of 2014, we stood on this stage, me and him, and his wife Lauren. And we stood here before friends and family, before God and the church, and walked through what the Bible says about marriage, walked through all kinds of vows, they exchanged rings, and at the end of that, I was able to say, by the power that has been invested in me by God and the great state of North Carolina, I now pronounce you man and wife. Now, I didn't have the authority to do that in and of myself. I can't walk around pronouncing people man and wife. That authority, had been, that authority had been given to me by the state in the marriage certificate. That authority had been given to me as an officiant by God and a pastor of this church. That authority was not mine. That authority was outside of me. Today, when church is over, you'll walk through the lobby there, and probably if you look to one side or the other, there you'll find a man in a dark uniform. On his chest is a badge, on his hip is a gun. He is there to protect, he is there to keep the peace, he is there to enforce the law. Now that man does not have authority in and of himself to keep the peace, to enforce the law, to protect us. That authority has been given to him by the state of North Carolina, by the county of Mecklenburg, by the city of Charlotte. Authority. That's what this passage is about, authority. And more specifically, who actually has authority? Let's get the context. Here we are uh, in the context. Here we are in the middle of the last week of the life of Jesus on earth. We're following him now. We're in Jerusalem, and there is a collision coming. It is a collision between the Roman Empire and the religious people and the Son of God. And that collision centers around who has the right, who has the authority, and where does that authority come from? This is an important passage for us as we live in a day and time that submitting to the authority of God increasingly puts us at odds with the world we live in. And we must decide how we will live, and by whose authority we will live. What I want to do today is take this passage. I hope to make the case. I want to make the case that Christ is king and he has all authority. In fact, if you want to know what the sermon is about, you think, what is he getting at? Here it is in a sentence. Christ is king. And he has all authority. Here's what I want to do. Let's go back and do a little mini Bible study. I'll walk through, be like a tour guide, point out a couple of things. Then we'll come back and make uh, some application by way of question. You join me. You just, you just look at the Bible and you might see some things that are interesting. Join me there in verse 27. <clears throat> Text tells us that they are back in Jerusalem. Who is the they? It is Jesus and his disciples. We already have had the triumphal entry. They went back to the Mount of Olives. And they came back for the cleansing of the temple. That was yesterday and created quite a ruckus there in Jerusalem and there in the Gentile court. Remember, he's flipping over tables, knocking over the money changers. It was a really wild day yesterday. They're back again, all of them. They're in the temple there in Jerusalem. He's walking and probably teaching. Verse 27, he is approached by a delegation, the chief priests and the elders 
and the scribes. Now, just as an aside, they make up what is known as the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is a 70-member court that judges all that goes on in Jerusalem. Here is a delegation that comes from the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. They are representing the authority in Jerusalem. They come to Jesus. They've got a question about his authority. In fact, you'll hear it four times in this passage. Authority, 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 authority. That's why we're talking about it, because that's the drive of the passage. Verse 28, they say to him, by what authority are you doing these things? What things? The triumphal entry, flipping over the tables when he cleansed the temple. They're saying, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to do this? That's what they're asking in verse 27 and verse 28. <clears throat> they're asking that because if anybody has power, they have power. Now, what makes you think you have power? So Jesus does what he always does. Verse 29 and 30, they've asked him a question, and he just turns it around. You answer a question with a question. I was always told, do not answer a question with a question. I think my dad would tell me that when he asked me something. Don't answer a question with a question. Well, Jesus did it. Why can't I do it? Look what he's doing here. He throws it back to the Sanhedrin. Look what he says in verse 29 and 30. <laughs> Jesus said to them, I'll ask you a question. You answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Here's the question, verse 30. It is a loaded question. Was the baptism of John from heaven? That is a Jewish way of saying God. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Then he presses them, answer me. So he puts pressure on them with this question. Was John from God or was he from man? They're in a dilemma. You see the dilemma here. In verse 30 and 31, so they discussed it with one another. They got a reason out. I mean, this is what a, this is what a good politician does. We got to think of what are the people going to say. So they're talking to one another, reasoning out the answer. Uh, we got to find out which way does the wind blow. Let's get out there and follow the wind. It's not what leaders do. It's what politicians do. So they're doing this. They're having this little talk there in verse 31 and 32, and so they say, "Look, if if we say from heaven." He'll say, well, why didn't you believe him? And, of course, verse 32, but shall we say from man? Because they're afraid. Mark tells us they're afraid of the people, you see. For the people knew that John was a prophet. So they did what, here's the good ambiguous answer. You've asked me a question, verse 33, we don't know. The ones that, let me ride the fence here, we don't know. Jesus said to them, Okay. And neither will I tell you by what authority, because it's God by what authority that I do these things. Now then, let's, let's go to it, and uh, I want to use some questions to, to just walk through how do we apply. Here are a couple of questions and maybe help us think through how to apply this passage. Here's the first one. Number one, who is going to rule your life? I want you to today, today to, to decide who is it? Who will rule? I mean, that, that is the ultimate question, isn't it? Who actually is in charge? At least that, that's what's happening here in verse 28. You'll see the word four times in this passage, authority. It's the Greek word, if you like these kind of things. Uh, it's a Greek word, exousia, E-X, if you like to spell it with English letters, E-X-S-O-U-S-I-A. E X S O U S I exousia. X means out of, susia, that is the substance. Do you have the power within? Who has it is the question. That's used 93 times in the New Testament, four times in this passage. Who has the right? Here's what's happened. Jesus has come in. He's turned the tables over in the temple. He has obviously upset the Sanhedrin who have all of the authority. They have sent a delegation in verse 27 and 28 to ask him, who do you think you are? They've come to threaten him. They lay before him, what gives you the right to do this? So you're a preacher, you start thinking, okay, where is the authority of Jesus described? What does the Bible say about the authority of Jesus? So you open the Bible and the Bible just, all these passages come out 
to speak of the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus through all eternity, the Son of God being worshipped by the angels. And, and Isaiah sees him sitting in Isaiah 6 on the throne and, and, and smoke fills the temple. Or Ezekiel sees the Son of God, the Son of Man, Daniel, all throughout the Old Testament, prophesied in the Psalms and all of the prophets. So I had to take the Old Testament and just let me put it aside. It's too much. They won't listen. People, they'll, they'll get bored. So let's let, look here. How about the New Testament? So then there's, it's all throughout the New Testament. <clears throat> so I picked out just a few, just a few. Mark chapter 3 tells us that Jesus has the authority to cast out demons, that Jesus stands with authority over the demons in hell. <clears throat> if Jesus has authority over the demons in hell, you have nothing to fear if you are his. Luke chapter 5 tells us, <clears throat> that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. This is the greatest news so far. This is what the gospel tells us, that Jesus Christ lived perfectly in our place. He did that as a man. As a man, he was completely righteous at the cross. He sheds that righteousness and takes our sin. 2 Corinthians says he became sin for us there at the cross. God pours out the wrath the judgment on all sinners that will be saved at the cross. He dies there, and God raises him from the dead. That great transaction is he takes your sin, gives you his righteousness. He has the power to forgive your sin. You struggle to forgive other people. Jesus doesn't struggle to forgive you. That is a finished work at the cross of Jesus. Luke chapter 5 tells us Jesus has the authority Authority to forgive your sins. Matthew chapter 7 tells us that Jesus teaches with authority. <clears throat> Go and read the Sermon on the Mount sometime. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount starts with the Beatitudes. Then after the Beatitudes, he takes the Ten Commandments and says, you thought you were keeping them because you're doing the externals, but I, I have something internal. You've heard it said that you shall not kill. I say to you, do not be angry. Then sigh. He has the authority to give us his ethic. Matthew chapter 10 tells us that Jesus has the authority over unclean spirits. Jesus has, are you saddled with some sin, some pornography, some sin that you're, you're saddled with that you can't break, some addiction? You should just hear it. Jesus Christ has authority over that. It does not have authority over him. Jesus will free you from that. Luke chapter 12 tells us that, that Jesus has the authority to cast into hell. That it's not Satan doing that. That he offers up the gospel to you this morning and you hear that gospel and you think, no, instead of Jesus dying, I don't want somebody to take the blame. Jesus dying for my sins, I'll take it myself. I'm my own man. And, and because of justice, Jesus cast, has the authority to say, casting into hell. Romans chapter 9 tells us that <clears throat> Jesus has the authority, the same authority that a potter has with the clay, to make that clay into whatever the potter actually wants the clay to be. He has that authority over us. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus is crucified, then raised from the dead. And before he ascends into heaven to be our intercessor, before he goes, he gives the Great Commission. And part of the confidence in sharing the gospel is what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. With that in mind, <clears throat> it's a good question. Who's going to rule your life? Is it going to be, is it going to be culture? You, maybe, you're, maybe you are actually pretty trendy, and you, you wouldn't say that you're ruled by it, but you certainly follow the trends. Is it going to be culture? Is it going to be a society that we live in? The mores of the society that we live in? You just saw a news clip, the Final Four is going on, and the head basketball coach for women's basketball in South Carolina was asked a question that if a biological male wants, it identifies as a woman, do you think that that person should be able to play women's basketball? And yes. 
uh, it's a complete dereliction. You can let society, or, or maybe your own passions, your own desires. Maybe yours is more respectable. You're, you're married, you have children, and what you end up doing is what do the kids want to do? We want to do with it. What do the kids want to do? Or, or maybe you're just struck with fears that keep you from doing things, or maybe it goes even further into some sort of anxiety. Maybe it's an addiction you can't shake. Maybe it's, um, <clears throat> my goodness, the election's coming up, and that's going to dominate the airwaves and will be on our minds or the government. Let me tell you, last Sunday, I didn't mention this last Sunday because I don't even want to mention it now, but I'm going to. Last Sunday, on Resurrection Day, our president named it Transgender Visibility Day. And I just want to say, Mr. President, the empty tomb has already given us the greatest visibility day that there ever was. <laughs> that, that, Christ, that Christ is king and he has all authority. The question then is, who will rule your life? The gospel invitation comes from the king that tells us that God is a good creator who created all of us in his image. That image of God in us has been disfigured by our own sin that separates us from God, and we are headed toward an eternal hell. But God is also loving and kind. He comes after us with the gospel in the form of his son, Jesus. Jesus, here in the pages of the Bible. Jesus walks perfectly, lives perfectly, is in perfect fellowship with God, keeps all of God's law. That is an earned righteousness as a man. A man lost the garden and righteousness. A man comes and earns it. He's not just a man, though. He's also God. And there on the cross, he takes the full wrath of God, all of it, as a man for us, as our substitute. God raises him from the dead to show that there is victory now over sin and death and hell and the grave. And the promise of the gospel is if you will turn from sin, it's, it's the word repentance. Look to Christ and you'll be saved. Who will rule your life? Let me give you a second question to maybe bore a little deeper into the text. Here's the second question, number two. Where does authority come from? Where does it come from? So you see the interchange in verses 29 and 30. They've asked Jesus, who do you think you are? Who gives you the right? Who gives you the authority? Verse 29 and 30, he does what he oftentimes, he just turns it around on them. He gives a counter question about the, about the ministry of John the Baptist of all people. So he takes them back to John, who the people thought was a prophet, and John who had baptized Jesus and put his stamp of approval on the ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus brings John the Baptist up and he says to them, verse 29 and 30, <clears throat> I'll ask you one question. Answer me. I'll tell, you about, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven? That's a way of saying from God. Was, it, was John's ministry of God or was it of man? Did he operate under the authority of God or was it something that was just man-made? Because there are really only two choices in life. Either God is doing it or man is doing it. This, this is the exact same thing that Elijah faced. You guys know the stories of the, in the Bible of Elijah on Mount Carmel when he battled the prophets of Baal. You should go and read it. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18. And in 1 Kings 18 on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18 verse 21, Elijah the text says, and Elijah came near all the people and he said to the people of God, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And that seems to be the tenor, at least, the tenor and tone of what Jesus is saying here of John the Baptist. If John the Baptist had the authority of God, and John the Baptist looked at Jesus, remember what he said? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? 
John the Baptist said of Jesus, he must become greater, I must become less. You know, you get to a certain age. You get to a certain age that you watch a specific kind of show on television. Connie and I have gotten to that age. There's a show called On Patrol Live. Y'all know that show? They follow the police officers around, and they're stopping them, and it can go on for hours. We've watched, we sit and watch every single one of those. And so it just keeps going. I mean, you don't have, it just keeps going. And then we ran out of episodes. And then the TV just tells you, here's something we think you'll like because you're watching that. And something called Jail. <laughs> so now we're watching a show called Jail. Jail is about what happens to people after they are arrested and before they're put to prison. Well, they go to jail. And they're in jail. You get to see how they're all the intake and all that goes on. Well, last night it popped up. Somebody, the, they were doing a show in Mecklenburg County. I thought, I may see some church members on here. <laughs> so, so I tuned in to watch uh, how it went down in Mecklenburg County. And there was a guy that had been busted for uh, drunkenness and disorderly conduct. He had been fighting. In fact, he fought so hard that somebody had torn his shirt off. And he had this spectacular cross tattoo right up on his chest. And uh, he's crying and screaming. And what he's saying is, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. He kept saying that over, over and over. And then somebody would look at him and say, I'll kill you. <laughs> so he had this kind of going back and forth. And uh, there was this juxtaposition of his confession of being a Christian and compared to his his behavior, his conduct. Now, now most of us are not going to have that kind of experience. Most of us have much more respectable battles going on. We claim to be a Christian, but we're, but we're judgmental or, or, or critical or negative or lusting or lying. And I want to just paraphrase Elijah. How long will you go on limping between the two? If Christ is king, then come to him. If not, then don't pretend. Christ is king and has all authority. I've given you two questions. I'd like to go to a third. Two questions. Let's go to a third and bore even deeper into the text. Here's a third question. Who do you fear most? Who do you fear most? If you find that in verses 31 and 32 and 33, we've dealt with the questioning of Jesus. Now, Jesus has turned the question back on the Sanhedrin, the delegation from the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, and now they're scratching their heads. Jesus has put the question back on them in verse 31. <clears throat> And they're deep in conversation. Let's listen to their conversation, verse 31. They discussed it with one another. So you can just see them huddling up. They discussed it with one another, and they said, okay, here are our options. Now, if we say that what John did was from heaven, then he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? Okay, on the other hand, verse 32, I mean, we can't say it's from man. And Mark tells us why I see the parentheses. Uh, they're, they're afraid of the people because the people, you see, the people know that John was a prophet. So what they're going to do, they know that there will be a riot if they, don't, if they say the wrong thing. So they are basing their behavior on what they know the people want to hear. They're coming up with an answer that is culturally appropriate. That puts them on the right side of history. That is politically informed. And then, and then way out of verse 33, they'll just come up finally. Here's the, I'm just, 
the ambiguity. We don't know. They were absolutely bent to the pressure of what people wanted to hear. Now, brothers and sisters, let me just talk to Christians right now. Brothers and sisters, we are facing tremendous pressure in our society to deny what we believe the Bible has taught as the truth for human flourishing. A couple of things. Like for, <clears throat> I'll start with a, an easy one. The exclusivity of Christ. To, to believe that Christ and Christ alone, his life, death, and resurrection, what he has done, the finished work of Jesus, his death on the cross, to believe that is what provides salvation and hope for all of mankind. That is the only thing that provides it. That puts us on thin ice culturally. For you to believe that God has created marriage as something good between a man and a woman for all creation, not just Christians, but for everyone, it's a creation ordinance, that he has given us that as a man and a woman, that that and only that between a man and a woman is appropriate and made for human flourishing. That same-sex marriage, so-called marriage, is an aberration of what God has given us. To have a theology of life, to, to believe that the Bible teaches that because you are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, that all people have been given the image of God, that we stand against and hate and want to abolish abortion, we also stand against and hate euthanasia because God alone has the right to, to believe that. A lot of you are facing this right now um, with your, your place of employment to be forced to have this, uh, to, to be forced to use pronouns that don't match with the sex of the person. And, and to think what, how we do this, or, or just monogamy in marriage. I mentioned it briefly, thinking that it is okay for a man to participate in a woman's sport. And we have to decide, honestly, as those who believe, as, as those who believe in what God has prescribed in His Word for human flourishing, who do we fear the most? Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. I mentioned it briefly early, uh, earlier. Let me, let me take a, a longer version. Luke chapter 12, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. This is what Jesus says. <clears throat> I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who has, after he has killed the body, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Not one of them is forgotten before God. Well, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are, you are much more valuable than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So with that in mind, we, we, we gladly, we joyfully acknowledge Jesus Christ is king. And the most religious people in this book, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, they missed it. So I'll make the last question my conclusion. This is the conclusion. Last question. I'll end with this. What will, what will you do with the opportunity? They knew the Bible. Chief priests, scribes, elders, they knew the Bible. They knew a version of God. They had a way of worshiping. And they say, they answered Jesus with an ambiguous answer. And at the end of verse 33, Jesus says to them, 
then I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you where this comes from. I'm not going to reveal the power of God that rests on Jesus. And they missed the last great opportunity to put their faith in Christ. Now listen, God has given you a very specific opportunity today to respond to what you've heard, to put your faith in Christ. You see, he is king and has all authority. That in mind this morning, would you join me as we go to the Lord in a moment of prayer and commitment? You join me as we pray with your heads bowed this morning. I'd like to invite any of you that have heard this this morning for the first time. It's registered in your heart, and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to talk to somebody. The way we do that here, we'll sing a song. I'll give you an opportunity to come forward. Our pastors are right down here, be down front, can pray with you. More than likely that, that you may be uncomfortable with that, when church is over, when we're done singing all the songs, when it's over and we're dismissed, our pastors are in the lobby. That is a really good opportunity to talk to one of our pastors about what it means for you to give your life to King Jesus. And I hope you will. Father in heaven, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us. God, I pray that you would stir in the hearts of men and women that have yet to yield that would joyfully see how good you are. I pray you would call people to yourself that this would be a day of salvation. I pray that this would be a day of strengthening for your church and for me, for the people of Hickory Grove, that you would find us faithful, living for our King. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together? In to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live and I surrender you to be seated. And today as we pray, perhaps you must confess that this time of our service, this moment of corporate prayer, perhaps for you is the by far and away longest extended time you ever spend in prayer. And if that is you, you're in good company. It is a common plight amongst God's people to struggle. On our best days, it feels like an act of wrestle, and most days it feels like a losing battle in prayer. And so if that's your fight, may I commend to you, I've done this before, but may I commend again, perhaps the tool that has strengthened my prayer life more than any other and it is not unique to me. There is a record of witnesses throughout the ages who have likewise found that there are few things that can fixate our mind and hearts in prayer. Few things like the Bible itself. You ever find when you pray that your mind wanders almost immediately? And before you know it, you are literally having a conversation with yourself about what you got to do that day and you had begun in prayer? 
pastor is no different. Today, I want to just invite you to just see, for example, how the Bible can actually arrest your attention to give you a, a framework, a, a trajectory to pray. I, I want to invite you just to return with me to the 92nd Psalm. It was what I read to begin our service. It'll be on the screens if you want, or if you want to open your Bible and lay it in your lap as I pray. Psalm 92. And I'd like to just return to verses 1 and 2 and just show you how reading a text of Scripture can prompt your mind and heart to pray with the Bible. Psalm 92, beginning in verse 1. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Would you join me as we pray? And let's ask the Lord to use this psalmist's words to prompt our mind and hearts as we approach his throne of grace with confidence. Would you join me now as we pray? Father in heaven, we confess with the psalmist of old that it is good to give thanks we confess how prone our hearts are to be thankless. Oh, forgive us, O oh God, for our discontent, our attitude of ingratitude that is just so common. Lord, would you remind me anew how much I ought to thank you for. Fill my mouth with praise, my heart with gratitude and thanksgiving, and remind me that it is your good and perfect will for us to do this. We are never more operating in our perfect design than when we are with hearts of thanksgiving expressing our gratitude to you. To sing praises to your name. Oh, Father, our mouths are prone to praise that which we find worthy. And so forgive us for how little we do so to the most worthy, the infinite name above all names, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're asking that you would so move in our hearts that we could not help but give praise to your name, O Most High. We trust, Lord, that one way we'll be inclined to do this is when we, like the psalmist of old, declare your steadfast love to us. And oh, how steadfast you have been to us. Would you remind us anew that when we are faithless, you are faithful. When we are not steadfast, so prone to wander, you are ever present, ever faithful, steadfast. And it's not some mere duty bound, rigid faithfulness. It is a steadfast love. And that's why we praise you. We who are most unlovable are loved by the infinite. Praise you, O oh God, for your steadfast love and for your faithfulness, Lord. We likewise give you thanks. If it weren't for it, we would be without hope but thanks to you our great God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ steadfast in love faithful night by night we have a hope unshakable and so Lord we pray that for the glory of your name you would make this church known for its gratitude its praise to your name alone and may it ever be on our lips that yours is a steadfast love and a faithfulness that will never fail. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to sing.
in this hour. I will believe. Praise God, church. We serve a God who is worthy, who has sent Christ to be the Savior of the world, to forgive us of our sins. Aren't you so glad for that this morning? Man, Easter was last week, but each and every week we get to come and celebrate what Christ has done for us. Let us finish with this. It says this in 2 Thessalonians. It says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today that we get to celebrate Sunday, the Lord's Day, a day that's set aside from all the other days to come, to gather and to worship you, to lift up the name of Jesus. But Father, let us not just leave it here. Let us take it with us to our neighbors, to the nations, to the people next door. Father, allow for us to be on mission this week for your name. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.